While solving the SVM problem, we often hide the bias term inside the model vector as an additional dimension and append a 1 to the feature vector. This hidden bias formulation has several advantages. We are able to do coordinate minimization on the dual and once we are done, the bias term is simply the last coordinate of the W vector. On the other hand, if we have an explicit bias term, we get a dual problem that has an additional constraint summation alpha i times yi equals 0 that links all the dual variables together. Click on the link above to revisit the derivation of this dual. This extra constraint prevents us from doing coordinate minimization since if we choose a variable alpha i and fix all others, the additional constraint completely fixes the value of alpha i, leaving no room for optimization. Moreover, while there's a nice formula telling us how to compute W once we have solved the dual, there's no such formula for B. It is easy to see why hiding the bias term is such a convenient thing to do. However, the hidden bias formulation has its disadvantages too. Since B is a part of the model vector now, the objective function is hiding a half B square term as well. This term discourages B from taking a large magnitude value. There's no such bias regularization if we use an explicit bias term. This can become a big deal if, for example, our data points are far away from the origin and a good separating boundary would need to use a large magnitude bias term. The explicit bias formulation would let the bias take large magnitude values freely. However, the hidden bias formulation would discourage this and may lead to smaller margins or even misclassifications. Today, we will try to see how to overcome the limitations of both the hidden bias as well as the explicit bias formulations. My wonderful friends, this is CS771, Introduction to Machine Learning and let's get started. Since the hidden bias formulation is otherwise so nice, let us try to see how to overcome the bias regularization problem. The simplest and most popular way is to append a larger constant at the end of the feature vector instead of appending a 1. This would act as a bias multiplier and let the effective bias take a large magnitude value without getting penalized. However, this multiplier constant needs to be tuned manually as a hyperparameter which takes more time and effort. The second way is to increase the value of the C hyperparameter so that bias regularization does not cause small margins or misclassifications. However, large values of C will slow down most solvers, which is a disadvantage. The third way is something that we should do anyway, and that is to pre-process data features properly, say by mean centering the data. The idea here is that if the data is closer to the origin, then it may not need a large magnitude bias term in the first place. However, this trick is not guaranteed to work, especially if the feature dimensionality D is large. Usually, some combination of these three tricks is used in practice. Given these challenges of the hidden bias formulation, it is tempting to see how to use the explicit bias formulation and overcome its limitations. The first challenge with the explicit bias formulation is that it does not allow coordinate minimization since the additional constraint summation alpha i times y i is equal to zero links all the dual variables together. One way to overcome this drawback is to perform batch coordinate minimization by optimizing over not one but two alpha coordinates in a single iteration. The SMO algorithm does this precisely. It's quite popular and implemented inside libraries such as scikit-learn. The acronym SMO stands for Sequential Minimal Optimization. However, unlike coordinate descent, where we could choose the coordinates in a relatively carefree manner such as cyclic or random, the choice of coordinate pairs in SMO needs to be done much more carefully which requires additional computations that can also increase training time. As an exercise, it would be nice to derive the batch coordinate minimization rule used in the SMO algorithm. Suppose we have chosen two coordinates i and j. Here we have shown the portion of the dual objective function and the dual constraints that depend on alpha i and alpha j. These expressions look very messy but can be cleaned up super quickly by introducing some helpful notation. Use variable elimination and the quint trick to solve this optimization problem completely with respect to alpha i and alpha j. Remember to eliminate not just a variable but its constraints as well. Also, Use pre-computation and bookkeeping techniques to make sure that each batch coordinate minimization step can be done in just order D time. 
Try to identify situations where a chosen pair is useless in the sense that performing optimization over the chosen pair does not change their values at all. SMO needs to avoid choosing such pairs since they just waste time without making any progress. If you are interested, you can read this famous paper by John Platt that first proposed the SMO algorithm. The second challenge with the explicit bias formulation is recovering the bias after we have solved the dual. We know this nice formula to recover the model vector after solving the dual, but none for the bias. To solve this problem, we need to retrace our steps while deriving the dual. Recall that the primal problem had two n constraints corresponding to which we had introduced two n dual variables alpha i and beta i. Alpha i corresponded to the constraint 1 minus xi i minus y i times w transpose x i plus b less than equal to 0 and beta i corresponded to the constraint xi i greater than equal to 0. We had seen that at the optimum, alpha i and beta i always add up to c and we had derived the dual by eliminating beta i. To find the optimal value of the bias term, we need to use a new result known as complementary slackness, which tells us that for every inequality constraint, the product of the expression for that constraint and the corresponding dual variable is always zero at the optimum. Note that there are two homophonic words in the English language that sound almost the same but don't mean the same. Whereas complement means to admire or congratulate something or someone, Complement means to add to an existing thing or make it complete. That little English lesson aside, we can use complementary slackness to recover the optimal value of the bias B star. Once we have solved the dual, first we pick any coordinate i such that alpha star i is strictly between 0 and c. It is neither 0 nor c. Since alpha star i is non-zero, complementary slackness tells us that the constraint expression must be 0 which means 1 minus xi star i minus y i times w star transpose x i plus b star must be equal to 0. Similarly, since alpha star i is strictly less than c, beta star i would become non-zero. Using complementary slackness now tells us that the slack term xi star i must be equal to 0. Combining these two results allows us to calculate the value of b star very easily. In practice, for numerical stability, we usually calculate the value of b star by using every i such that alpha star i is strictly between 0 and c and taking the average. This technique for finding b star may fail to work if we cannot find any alpha star i strictly inside the interval 0 to c. To handle such cases, we need to do some more work. But first, let us learn a bit more about this new tool that we have discovered. Consider a general minimization problem with some inequality constraints and some equality constraints. Note that all the inequality constraints are less than equal to constraints since we have converted all greater than equal to constraints into less than equal to constraints by negating both the sides. We know how to create the Lagrangian for this problem by introducing dual variables, say alpha i and gamma k. However, recall that the purpose of creating the Lagrangian was to introduce exact barrier functions. When solving the primal problem, maximizing the Lagrangian over the dual variables yields the original objective function value if every constraint is satisfied and infinity if even one constraint is violated. Thus, we see that at the optimum, if a particular inequality constraint is strictly satisfied, for example, gi of x star is strictly less than zero, then the corresponding value of alpha star i must take the value zero so that the barrier is switched off. Since gi can never take a positive value at the optimum, this means that alpha star i times gi of x star must always be equal to zero at the optimum, which is precisely what complementary slackness claims. We note that complementary slackness gives meaningful results only for inequality constraints, since for equality constraints, the constraint expression itself must take the value zero at the optimum. Let us now handle the edge cases that we had identified earlier. If we find that every alpha star i value is either 0 or c, we need to do a bit more work. If a certain alpha star i value is equal to 0, we know that the corresponding beta star i value must be equal to c. Using complementary slackness now tells us that the corresponding slack term xi star i must be equal to 0. This allows us to eliminate xi star i from this constraint giving us a constraint on b star. Note that in this case we cannot claim that this expression is equal to 0 since complementary slackness only tells us that alpha star i times this expression is equal to zero. 
and since alpha star i is itself equal to 0 this expression can take non zero values similarly if a certain alpha star i value is equal to c complementary slackness tells us that 1 minus xi star i minus y i times w star transpose x i plus b star must be equal to 0 since xi star i is always non negative this gives us another constraint on b star note that we cannot claim xi star i equal to 0 in this case since complementary slackness only tells us that beta star i times xi star i is equal to 0 and since beta star i is already equal to 0 in this case xi star i is free to take non zero values thus for the n data points we will get n constraints on b star any value of b star that satisfies all these constraints will be optimal a proof of this result is a bit more complicated and involves a more powerful theorem known as the karush kuntaka theorem which is beyond the scope of this discussion let us summarize the process of recovering the model and the bias term once we have solved the dual for the explicit bias formulation. We first recover the model vector using the standard formula and then do some pre-computations such as finding the set S of points for which alpha star i is strictly between 0 and c and pre-computing w star transpose xi for all the data points. Next, if the set S is non-empty, we can directly find the value of b star. Else, if every alpha star i is either 0 or c, then we can find out the upper and lower bounds, in this case k and l, imposed on b star by the constraints we saw previously. We can then choose any value in the interval k to l as the value for b star. If this way of computing the bias using complementary slackness seems too mysterious to you, there is a more direct way, but it would involve a bit more work. In this alternate strategy, once we have solved the dual and obtained w star, we simply solve another optimization problem to find b star directly. We see that there are no constraints on b star and the objective function is also much simpler since w star has already been fixed. The objective function is a summation of terms that look like the ReLU function applied to si minus b if yi is 1, else the ReLU function applied to si plus b if yi is minus 1. We see that terms of both kinds look like ReLU functions or their mirror images that have been shifted along the x-axis by various amounts. It turns out that functions that are the sum of several such terms are piecewise linear functions. It would help to express this function as a sum of two summations, a summation over positively labeled points and a summation over negatively labeled points. Such functions can be optimized fairly quickly if we are careful. To see this at work, let us take a toy example where there are only 5 terms in the summation, 3 corresponding to positively labeled points and 2 corresponding to negatively labeled points. The constant values in these terms are p, q, r, s and t that have been sorted in increasing order for sake of simplicity. Here we show the individual ReLU and mirrored ReLU functions separately on the number line for easy visualization. To see what this function looks like, it helps to look at only a portion of the number line at a time. For values of x less than p, we see that the fourth and fifth terms are zero, whereas the ReLU function acts as identity on the first three terms. This tells us that for values of x less than p, the function is simply a linear function, p plus q plus s minus three times x. Similarly, we see that this function behaves linearly over other intervals over the number line as well. The reason behind the name piecewise linear function also makes a lot of sense now. This function is not linear overall, but instead is composed of several linear pieces. Note that this function is still convex, albeit non-differentiable. From this example, we can also guess that this function will be minimized at one of the points P, Q, R, S or T itself. It's just that we don't know which one. Such functions can often have multiple global optima, as we can see in this toy example, where all the points in the interval r to s are global optima. Take this as a challenge and design an algorithm that can take a piecewise linear function that is a sum of n terms, each of which looks like a ReLU or a mirrored ReLU and find its minimum in order n log n time. Preprocessing the constant values in these terms, such as sorting them, may help you achieve this goal. After solving this exercise, you would be able to use your algorithm to find out the optimal value of the bias without using complementary slackness derivations. However, we note that the complementary slackness root can be faster at calculating the optimal value of b, especially if we are able to find a value of alpha star i that is strictly between 0 and c.
Today, we explored two closely related formulations for learning linear models, one with hidden bias and another one with explicit bias. We observed that both have their advantages and disadvantages. We saw that the hidden bias formulation is quite convenient algorithmically but has a bias regularization problem which can cause poor margins or misclassifications. We saw how to overcome this problem using various techniques such as data preprocessing and hyperparameter tuning. We then observed that the explicit bias formulation does not face this bias regularization issue but has algorithmic challenges. We explored ways to overcome these algorithmic challenges by using dual batch coordinate minimization as used by the SMO algorithm. Along the way, we got introduced to the complementary slackness property and we saw its applications to recover the optimal bias term when using an explicit bias. We also saw an alternative technique to recover the optimal bias term using piecewise linear optimization. That's all for this discussion today. Stay beautiful as always and see you next time.